Okay, anyway, hello, <laughs> and welcome to the Somerset Library's presentation called 15 Holiday Jewels. Um, as you heard, my name is Dr. Bill uh, Tierfelder, and I will be your host. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities. Um, I currently live in Portland, Oregon, uh, where I am a lecturer, a writer, and an artist. And I also return to my hometown of New York City regularly to continue my work at the American Museum of Natural History. Now, because we, let me just go there, here we go. Now, because we can't cover everything about today's topic in one presentation, uh, I invite you to take a deeper dive on my website, which uh, Daryl has already put into the chat, but it is makingwings.net. And you see there, deeper dive number 25. Uh, let me explain. So let's go to my website. And you should be seeing it now. If you go to, uh, this is my homepage. Um, and uh, I always like to say there are my, the three pictures of me, me, myself, and I. Uh, and if you go to the upper right corner, there's a hamburger menu. And you can go and look at my library schedule, some of the topics I speak of, examples of my writing, my art. You can even look at my resume. But for our purposes, um, you see all these things called deeper programs that I give, I create a web page so that you can do more work. You can do a deeper dive. So in this case, it's number 25, 15 holiday jewels. And if you click onto that, and there are a few more, um, and what you're going to find are web resources that you can look up on the different writers we're going to be talking about today, as well as others that we don't have time for. Uh, I give a, a selection of recommended readings. Um, and then uh, pictures of some of the people we're talking about, as well as some of the stories. And um, again, I don't want to make people dizzy here. I just want to show you what I have at the end. Yes, um, for all of the stories and the honorable mentions, um, there's, a, a well, not the honorable mentions, but for the stories we're focusing on, I actually have links to either the story or something about the story. So um, please feel free uh, to take advantage of that. Okay, so as you saw, one of the things that you, you saw was the uh, uh, recommended media. Um, here are some of the things that I recommend. Um, there's an ind <clears throat> independently published quartet of books uh, that's available on uh, Amazon. Uh, they contain several of the stories we're looking at today. So uh, uh, volume one of A Timeless Treasury of Christmas Tales. And again, this is all on the website if you want to copy this down, the titles. Um, it had, this has O. o. Henry's The Gift of the Magi um, and the complete novella by Washington Irving called Old Christmas. Uh, volume two uh, has uh, the delightful novella by L. Frank. A fourth volume has wonderful stories like Anthony Trollope's uh, uh, Christmas uh, at uh, Thompson Hall. Um, so wonderful, wonderful collection. There's Truman Capote's A Christmas Memory that I certainly recommend. Certainly everybody knows uh, a Dickens' Christmas Carol, but he also wrote, a lot of people don't realize that, he also wrote four other Christmas novels. So it ain't just A Christmas Carol. There are other goodies there. Um, and we're actually going to be looking at one of those a little later on. How about Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales? Um, so there are many, many books out there, but what is today about? Well, what I'd like to do is to share with you, uh, 15 wonderful 
holiday stories and a few honorable mentions that you might not know or that maybe you haven't read yet. And I'd love to give you some ideas for holiday entertainment that, that has nothing to do with a Christmas carol or Charlie Brown Christmas or the Nutcracker. Nothing wrong with those classics, but sometimes we have a hankering for something that's uh, a little bit uh, different. So I'm going to begin with a couple of disclaimers. First off, I'm absolutely sure that there are wonderful European, South American, Asian, and African holiday stories. But to keep uh, this project simple, I stuck to kind of a top 15 or a top 20 list, um, lists from a variety of sources, all of which you can find on my website, by the way. Newspapers, magazines, literary scholars, uh, not the least of which Oprah Winfrey. Um, so in fairness, while there might be many jewels that are left out, there are also a, a great deal of you know, wonderful stuff in some of these uh, books. Um, and second, you'll note that I'm presenting uh, each author and his or her story alphabetically. And I didn't want to risk playing favorites. Again, because of time constraints, I've decided to give you only two or three interesting facts per slide about each writer. Um, if we were in the classroom or the library community room of your uh, library right now, instead of Zoom land, um, we could spend much more time going over other biographical uh, uh, details. However, if you do want to experience a deeper dive into the lives uh, and writings of each author, uh, once again, uh, there's makingwings.net, Deeper Dive 25. And as you saw, there are links to the complete biographies, uh, short summaries, and many other related materials. So with all of that said, why don't we get started? And we're going to start with our first uh, uh, author, alphabetically. Sure, he needs no introduction. It is Hans Christian Andersen. Um, he was born in 1805 near Copenhagen, Denmark, and he died there in 1875. Today, he's regarded as the Danish master of the literary fairy tale. Now, literary fairy tales are original stories not based on previous sources. So that's the difference between, let's say, a Grimm Brothers fairy tale and a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. The Grimm brothers went around Europe to collect stories, particularly in Germany, and then they printed them. They were pre-existing from an oral tradition. Hans Christian Andersen, L. Frank Baum, many other writers, this is from their own imagination. So they're creating the fairy tale, uh, original fairy tale, and those are called the literary fairy tale. Well, Anderson was also the author of plays, novels, poems, travel books, and several autobiographies. Now, while most of those works are almost unknown outside of Denmark, his fairy tales are among the most frequently translated works in all of literary history. Uh, in fact, last year, I actually saw um, a, a Chinese uh, edition of Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. So he, he's known the world over. Now, Andersen's first book of tales was published in 1835, and it included such stories as The Princess and the Pea and Little Ida's Flowers. Many other collections appeared between 1837 and a final anthology in the 1870s called New Fairy Tales and Stories, which contained some of his masterpieces. Now, these anthologies broke new ground in both style and content, often using everyday language, uh, thus breaking with literary tradition, which, you know, tended to be more formal language, you know, sometimes the and vowel language. Um, Anderson, common everyday language. And one of the reasons for Anderson's ongoing appeal to both children and adults is that well, he wasn't afraid of introducing feelings and ideas that were beyond a child's immediate comprehension, yet we're still in touch with the child's perspective. So these stories can be appreciated by both children and by adults. 
Now, the holiday story that I recommend for you is The Steadfast Tin Soldier. And it's an example of a literary fairy tale and was published for the first time in 1838. Now, though the story doesn't take place specifically during the December holiday seasons, the tale has often been associated with Christmas because many film and stage versions place the narrative on that day. In it, a boy receives a set of toy soldiers cast from an old tin spoon. One of the soldiers spies a very pretty paper ballerina and falls in love with her. That night, a jack-in-the-box who also loves the ballerina warns the soldier to take his eyes off her, but the soldier ignores him. The next day, the jack-in-the-box goblin pushes the soldier out of the window. Two boys find him, place him in a paper boat, and set him sailing off in the gutter. Now, among many adventures, the soldier is swallowed by a fish. When this fish is caught and cut open, the tin soldier finds himself once again on a tabletop in front of the ballerina. The still jealous jack-in-the-box makes the boy throw the tin soldier into the fire. A sudden wind blows the ballerina into that same fire next to him, and both are consumed. Well, is that really the ending? Well, you'll just have to read about it. It's a sad but beautiful story, and it's one of Anderson's best written tales, so I recommend it. Next up, L. Frank Baum. In 1897, Baum published his first collection for young readers called Mother Goose in Prose, which was illustrated by the renowned artist Maxfield Parrish. He soon followed up this work with his hugely popular Father Goose, his book. <laughs> this collection of stories became the top-selling children's title of 1899. Well, of course, the claim to fame. In 1900, Baum introduced readers to the wonderful Wizard of Oz. The story of Dorothy's quest to find her way home, accompanied by a tin woodsman, a scarecrow, and a cowardly lion, was so successful, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, was so successful that Baum actually wrote 13 more Oz adventures. So there's a grand total of 14 Wizard of Oz novels. Most everybody only knows the first one, but there are 13 others. Um, take a gander at them. They're really quite wonderful. And two years after the original Oz novel was published, Baum produced a musical version of the book. It opened in Chicago and went on to run for two years on Broadway. It then successfully toured the United States until 1911. Well, Baum reimagined Santa Claus in 1902 with The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. He found such success with that book that he had Santa make appearances in several other novels, including some of the Oz novels and in several short stories. Well, ultimately, Baum wrote some 60 books the bulk of them for younger readers. In 1910, Baum and his family moved to Hollywood where he worked to bring his stories to the big screen. And he died there in 1919. Now, I recommend a delightful short story that Baum wrote in 1904 called A Kidnapped Santa Claus. The story deals with Santa Claus's kidnapping by five pagan demons who live in a cave. Um, why do they kidnap him? Well, it's in an effort to thwart his yearly delivery of toys. Uh, the, the demons, uh, who are called selfishness, envy, hatred, malice, and a rather ambiguous demon called repentance, resent that Santa's influence keeps children from visiting their cave. 
So they kidnap Santa on Christmas Eve. Well, the rest of the story deals with rescue operations and a very forgiving Santa who returns things to normal. It's been called one of Baum's most beautiful stories, and it constitutes an influential contribution to the mythology of Christmas and especially Santa Claus. Our next writer is Pearl S. Buck, who lived from 1892 to 1973. Though she was primarily educated in the United States, she spent major portions of her life in China, first as the daughter of Presbyterian missionaries, and then as the wife of a missionary, and eventually as an English professor at various universities. She uh, began contributing articles on Chinese life to American magazines in the 1920s. And in 1930, she published her first novel, East Wind, West Wind, which deals with the complexities of a Chinese family split between America and their Asian homeland. Well, as you probably already know, her career truly took off from there. The Good Earth, published in 1931, is a poignant tale of a Chinese peasant and his slave wife. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 1932, and it established Buck as a major interpreter of East to the Westerners. And was this novel, of course, was adapted for the stage um, and became a very highly regarded Oscar-winning film as well. It was followed by the novel Sons in 1932 and another called A House Divided in 1935. The three books together, Good Earth, Sons, House Divided, were collected as a trilogy that was published to get as a unit uh, in 1935 under the general title of The House of Earth. And as a result of these three books and her articles and other work, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1938. Uh, one of the few women ever to win a Nobel Prize and certainly one of the few to win it for literature. Well, from 1935 forward, uh, Buck lived in the United States with her second husband and with him established an adoption agency called Welcome House, which served thousands across the world until 2014, when international adoption laws changed. Meanwhile, in 1964, she also created another child sponsorship agency, the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, which since 1991, is called Pearl S. Buck International, and it's headquartered on Buck's estate, uh, which is Green Hills Farm in Pennsylvania. The story I picked from Buck that I, I think is certainly worth a look, it's, it's quite beautiful. It's a short story. It's a story called Christmas Day in the Morning, and it's definitely one of our 15 jewels. This short story was originally published in 1955. Now, without giving too much away, it tells the story of a young man named Rob who finds himself on Christmas Eve without a gift for his beloved father. The story is told as a flashback. Early one Christmas, Rob, as an older man, thinks back to the best Christmas morning in the year when he was 15 and living on his family's dairy farm. That year, Rob surprised his father with a very special heartfelt gift by getting up in the middle of the night to do all the milking by himself so that his father could have Christmas morning off. The boy's joy in planning the surprise for his father and the touching appreciation, pride, and love in the father's gratitude are told beautifully. Now, I recommend the lovely Harper Collins illustrated version of the story with realistic uh, paintings by Mark Booner. His deep toned, striking illustrations are a feast for the eyes. 
And again, this is a story I would probably say intended for younger readers. So um, for any of us who are of a certain age, this is a great read for your grandkids or for young children, but it's a beautiful story for us adults too. Well, for us adults, um, there's Truman Capote who was born in 1924 in New Orleans and died in 1984 in Los Angeles. Now, because his parents divorced when he was young, he spent his childhood with various elderly relatives in small towns in Louisiana and Alabama. He attended private schools and eventually joined his mother and stepfather, Joseph Capote, at Millbrook, Connecticut, where he completed his education. Well, he achieved early literary recognition in 1945 when his haunting short story, Miriam, was published in Mademoiselle magazine. His first published novel, Other Voices, Other Rooms, in 1948, was highly acclaimed. But one of Capote's most popular works, Breakfast at Tiffany's, was first uh, published in Esquire magazine in 1958. The 1961 film version with Audrey Hepburn is an Oscar-winning classic, uh, despite what is now seen as an offensive portrayal of the heroine's Japanese landlord. That aside, it was a classic movie, and uh, it introduced the idea of the little black dress. Well, Capote's greatest success was his nonfiction novel, In Cold Blood, which is a chilling account of the murders of four members of a Kansas family in 1959. The 1965 book and the 1965 Oscar-nominated film were both critical and popular successes and proved to be the high point of Capote's dual careers as a writer and a celebrity socialite. Endowed with... Let me, I went too far. There we go. Uh, endowed with a quirky but a, a attractive, uh, he was a quirky and 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 attractive character. Uh, he he entertained television audiences with outrageous tales uh, recounted in his distinctly high pitched lisping southern drawl. Well, in the late 1960s, he adapted two short stories about his childhood. Uh, a Christmas Memory and The Thanksgiving Visitor into award-winning television films. Now, these were the last major successes of this jet-set celebrity, right? Um, in, in later years, Capote's growing dependence on drugs and alcohol stifled his productivity and eventually brought about his death. Now, I absolutely confess that the story, A Christmas Memory, is one of my absolute favorite holiday stories. And the Geraldine Page film adaptation remains a holiday treat. Now, without revealing too much, the story is narrated by a seven-year-old boy named Buddy, who tells us about his delightful relationship with his older female cousin, Sook. Though the family is very poor, Buddy and the elderly Sook save their pennies, which they use during the holiday Christmas season to collect pecans and buy other ingredients to make fruitcakes. Now, although set during the prohibition, they send their whiskey-soaked cakes to everyone from acquaintances they've only met once or twice to people they've never met at all, like President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The story continues to unfold and has one of the most beautifully written and heart-wrenching endings in 20th century American literature. Total recommendation. Our fifth story was written by Russian author Anton Chekhov, who was born in 1860 and died in 1904. Today, he's recognized as a master of the modern short story and one of the leading playwrights of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
Through his stories and plays, Chekhov emphasized the depths of human nature, the hidden significance of everyday events, and the fine line between comedy and tragedy. During the mid-1880s, after attending medical school and becoming a doctor, Chekhov began to pop. But there was also this life as a writer. Chekhov wrote many of his greatest stories during the last decade of his all too short life, including Ward Number no. Six and The Lady with the Dog. They reveal a profound understanding of human nature and the ways in which ordinary events can carry deeper meanings. In his plays of those same final years, Chekhov collaborated with Konstantin Stanislavsky and the Moscow Art Theater to produce his masterpieces, uh, The Seagull, Uncle Vanya, The Three Sisters, and of course, The Cherry Orchard. Through that famous theater group, which created what we call method acting, Chekhov met and eventually married the actress Olga Nipper. Sadly, their marriage lasted only three years. Why? Because he died rather painfully of tuberculosis at the age of 44. Well, now considered one of Chekhov's better stories, At Christmas Time was published in 1900, and it's divided into two parts. The first half follows an illiterate peasant family who hires an ex-soldier to write a letter to their estranged daughter as they ponder the mystery of her life. They, they want to know more about her, and they write this letter. Well, the second part involves the letter being delivered to the daughter by her abusive husband. And we learned what has transpired in her life. Chekhov's fiery social critique is presented as he contrasts the warmth and love of hard village life with the coldness of upper class luxury. Now, moving along, we meet Charles Dickens. How could I not include Dickens, right? who was born in Portsmouth, England, England in, on February 7th of 1812. When he was 12 years old, his father, John, who had a difficult time managing money and was constantly in debt, was put into debtor's prison. And because of this, Charles was withdrawn from school and forced to work in a shoe polish factory to help support the family. This experience left profound psychological and sociological marks on Charles. Well, after his father was released, the young Dickens eventually found employment as uh, an office boy at an attorney's and then as a shorthand reporter in the courts and afterwards as a parliamentary newspaper reporter. In 1836, Dickens married Catherine Hogarth and together uh, they had 10 children before they separated in 1858. After early successes with sketches by Boz and the Pickwick Papers, Dickens produced work of increasing complexity at an incredible rate, including Oliver Twist in 1839, Nicholas Nickleby that same year, and the following year in 1840, The Old Curiosity Shop. Uh, Dickens' series of five Christmas books began appearing in 1834. Now, most everyone, of course, knows the first one, A Christmas Carol from 1843. But there were actually four more. The Chimes from 1844, The Cricket on the Hearth in 1845, The Battle of Life, 1846, and The Haunted Man in 1848. Well, Dickens followed their commercial success with novels including uh, David uh, Copperfield, um, Bleak House, and <clears throat> A Tale of Two Cities, and of course his masterpiece in 1861, Great Expectations. Uh, by the way, uh, I recently was uh, put on, uh, this is a little sidebar here, uh, was put on the uh, uh, track to, to, for this information, 
uh, Barbara Klinghoffer uh, wrote a uh, her own version, if you will, a updated version of David Copperfield called Demon Copperhead, uh, which uh, is getting wonderful reviews. So just pass that on to you. Well, meanwhile, back to Dickens. Uh, by 1856, his popularity had allowed him to buy Gads Hill Place, an estate he had admired since childhood. And you see that on your screen. In 1858, Dickens began uh, a series of public readings, which became instantly popular. In all, Dickens performed was giving readings. And in that year of 1858, after a long period of difficulties, his, he separated from his wife. And it was also around that time that Dickens became involved in an affair with a young actress named Ellen Tiernan. Now, the exact nature of their relationship is unclear, but it was clearly central to Dickens' personal and professional life. In the closing years of his life, Dickens made his already declining health much worse by giving so many readings, writing, reading. He was a total workaholic. And it was during one of his readings in 1869, he collapsed, showing symptoms of a stroke. He retreated to that mansion, Gads Hill, and he began working on what would be his last novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drew. Unfortunately, he never finished it. He died at home in June of 1870 and was buried in the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are theater buffs, you may be aware that The Mystery of Edwin Drood uh, in the 1980s uh, was made into a Broadway musical, which actually won the Tony Award. Um, and part of the fun of that musical was at the very ending, um, all the characters lined up on the stage with big numbers over their head. And uh, the audience decided who done it, who murdered Edwin Drood. Yeah, it, it, lots of fun. Well, the story that I picked, again, it's one of those Christmas novels. And it's, uh, again, everybody knows a Christmas carol, but here's one that I think you might really enjoy. It's called The Cricket on the Hearth, A Fairy Tale of Home. Okay. Like all five of Dickens' Christmas books, it was published in book form, not as a serial. All of his other novels were, were serialized in newspapers and magazines before they were put into hard print. The five Christmas novels were all went, you know, direct to DVD, as they say, it went directly to a published hardcover book. And this book sold briskly. And there were no fewer than 17 stage productions of The Cricket on the Hearth opening during the Christmas season of 1845 when it was originally published, with one production opening on the same day as the book's release. And believe it or not, for years, it was actually more popular in its stage incarnations than A Christmas Carol. Kind of find that hard to believe, right? But this was actually the more popular Christmas book. Now, in this wonderful story, John Peerybingle, don't you love Dickens' names? John Peerybingle, a messenger carrier, lives with his young wife, Dot, their baby boy, and their nanny, Tilly. A cricket chirps on the hearth and acts as a guardian angel to the family, hence the cricket on the hearth. He's the guardian angel. Well, one day a mysterious stranger appears and takes up lodging for a few days. And the life of the Peary Bingles, then after that, intersects with that of Caleb Plummer, a poor toy maker who has a blind daughter, Bertha, and a son, Edward, who traveled to South America and is thought to be dead. And more than that, I won't tell you. Uh, it's a wonderful story and a delightful change from the ubiquitous Christmas Carol. Now, our next author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, like Chekhov, was a doctor. Uh, he was born in 1859 in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, and died in 1930 in Sussex, England. Uh, while he was a medical student in Edinburgh, Conan Doyle was deeply impressed by the observation skills of his 
uh, one of his professors, Dr. Joseph Bell. Bell ended up becoming the model for Sherlock Holmes, who first appeared in the novel A Study in Scarlet, published in 1887. Conan Doyle's early interest in both science and paranormal activity were the complex and diametrically opposing beliefs he struggled with throughout his life. Here was the scientist doctor, but who was also interested in, you know, ESP, ghosts, fairies, elves, paranormal, all kinds of paranormal, uh, paranormal phenomena. Well, Doyle continued writing Sherlock Holmes adventures through 1926. His stories were collected into several volumes and he wrote three more Sherlock novels, most famously, The Hound of the Baskervilles. But Doyle also produced a tale of 14th century chivalry called The White Company in 1891 and a masterwork of science fiction called The Lost World in 1912. Uh, Doyle was knighted, that's why he's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he was knighted in 1902 for his work with a field hospital in South Africa and other services during the South African Boer War. Now Conan Doyle himself viewed his most important efforts to be his campaign in support of spiritualism, the religion and psychic research subject based upon the belief that spirits of the departed continue to exist in the hereafter and can be contacted by those who are still living. Uh, Doyle died in his home in Sussex, and on July the 13th, 1930, thousands of people filled London's Royal Albert Hall for a seance during which a spiritualist medium claimed to have contacted Sir Arthur from beyond. Well, Christmas story that I recommend or a holiday story, definitely, of the Blue Carbuncle. Well, recommending the Blue Carbuncle, uh, a Carbuncle as a Christmas story isn't Far from recommending one of my favorite movies, uh, Die Hard with Bruce Willis. The stories both take place with Christmas as the backdrop, but there's always been a controversy as to whether they are actually, do they actually qualify as holiday tales? Now, I say yes. And Doyle's story continually ends up on favorite Christmas story lists. Well, without giving too much away, uh, and by the way, as far as Die Hard, it's a family tradition in our household to watch it on Christmas Eve. Just saying. Anyway, without giving too much away, as London prepares for Christmas, <clears throat> newspapers report the theft of the near priceless gemstone, the Blue Carbuncle, from the hotel suite of a wealthy countess. John Horner, who's a plumber and a previously convicted felon, is soon arrested for the theft. Now, Horner claims innocence, but his record and his presence in the Countess's room, where he was repairing a fireplace, are all that the police need. Well, meanwhile, just after Christmas, Dr. Watson pays a visit to Sherlock Holmes, where he finds the detective contemplating a hat and the story of a Christmas goose, both of which had been dropped by a man in a scuffle with some street ruffians near where Sherlock Holmes lives. Well, how the tale of the hat, the goose, and the blue carbuncle, how they all intertwine, it's just delicious fun. So big recommendation. Our next writer, of course, O. Henry pseudonym for William Sidney Porter. He was born in 1862 in North Carolina, and he died in New York City in 1910. Now, after attending a school run by his aunt and clerking in his uncle's drugstore, he moved to Texas in 1882, he's 20 years old, where he worked a variety of jobs, including as a teller in the First National Bank of Austin, Texas. 
Well, in February of 1896, he was indicted for embezzlement of bank funds. Well, one theory is that he was actually a whistleblower and not a thief. Again, it's kind of an unsolved case. In any event, the very, very well-liked Porter received the lightest possible sentence. And in 1898, he entered the penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio. His five-year sentence was shortened for good behavior. Now, while he was a night druggist there in the prison hospital, he wrote stories to earn money to support his daughter, Margaret, after his wife had died. His stories were immediately popular, and when he emerged from prison, William Porter had become O. Henry and would become famous as the writer of over 600 short stories. And there are many, re there are many theories as to why he picked the name O. Henry. Have fun Googling that. Well, from December of 1903 to January of 1906, he produced a story every single week for the New York Sunday World, as well as other publications. His hardcover story collections, Cabbages and Kings from 1904 and The Four Million from 1906, and its famous story, The Gift of the Magi, and The Trimmed Lamp from 1907 were all immediate successes. Between 1907 and his death in 1910, seven other collections appeared in rapid succession. Many of his best stories explore the lives of New Yorkers living out their hopes and dreams against the backdrop of the daily grind of urban life. Well, despite his popularity, O. Henry's final years were marred by ill health, desperate financial struggles, alcoholism, and an unhappy second marriage. After his death, several more volumes of unpublished or early stories appeared. The O. Henry Prize, given annually to outstanding short stories, was established in his honor in 1919 and remains a much coveted prize. Well, if you've never read The Gift of the Magi, you're in for a treat. It's a story of a young husband and wife, Della and Jim, and how they deal with the challenge of buying secret Christmas gifts for each other with very little money. Oh, it's a sentimental story for sure, but has a wonderful moral lesson about gift giving that's been adapted very often, especially for presentation at Christmas time. The plot and its twist ending are well known, and that ending is generally considered one of the best examples of comic irony in all literature. But if you've never read it, I won't give anything away, so no spoilers, please. Next up, E.T.A. Hoffman, Ernest Feodor Amadeus, yes, named after the composer Mozart, Mo Hoffman. Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffman was born on January 24th of 1776 in Königsberg, Prussia, and died uh, on June 25th in 1822 in Berlin. He was a writer, composer, and painter known for his short stories in which supernatural and sinister characters move in and out of people's lives, uh, <clears throat> ironically revealing the tragic or grotesque sides of human nature. Now, Hoffman was trained in law, but his chief interest was music. He held several positions as a conductor, critic, and theatrical music director. He also composed several widely successful ballets, operas, and chamber works. But even as he was fulfilling his musical ambitions, he also wrote numerous short stories that established his reputation as a writer. You get the idea, he's a Renaissance man. He's a lawyer, he's a composer, he's a writer, quite something. And through it all, he did support himself as a lawyer in Berlin. He succumbed to the effects of paralytic syphilis 
1822 at the age of 46. I would say, by the way, in terms of his music, um, if you go to YouTube and you just type in E.T.A. Hoffman, you can find many examples of selections from uh, his chamber music, his orchestral work, and even some arias from his opera. He's actually quite a wonderful composer. Now, in his stories, the weird and the mysterious atmosphere of his strange characters intermingles with an exact and realistic narrative style. His use of fantasy, ranging from fanciful fairy tales to highly suggestive stories of the macabre and supernatural, served as inspiration to several operatic composers, uh, including most famously Jacques Offenbach, who transformed three of Hoffman's stories into the opera The Tales of Hoffman, in which Hoffman himself is the central figure. Indeed, Next to stage adaptations of Dickens' Christmas Carol, Tchaikovsky's ballet, based on the novella The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, is the most ubiquitous Christmas theater piece during the holidays. Now, the original story concerns a girl named Marie who receives a nutcracker on Christmas Eve that looks like a soldier. Now, she's called Clara in the ballet and in other adaptations. Well, that night, Marie witnesses a battle between her dolls under the leadership of the Nutcracker and dozens of mice whose king has seven heads. Well, the following day, Marie finds out that the Nutcracker was once a young man who was cursed by the Mouse Queen. Further battles between the Nutcracker and the Mouse King take place before the rodents are defeated and the curse is finally broken. And, as they say, everyone lives happily ever after. Now, if you only know the ballet, and it's wonderful, do yourself, though, a favor and read the original story by Hoffman. It's really quite wonderful. Our tenth writer is Washington Irving, who was born in New York City in 1783 and died on his estate in Terrytown, New York, in 1859. Though he studied law and became a lawyer in 1806, Irving was always attracted to writing and <clears throat> early on began contributing delightful tales to New York newspapers and magazines. One of those early successes was History of New York by Diedrich Knickerbocker, published in 1809. It's a comic history of the Dutch regime in New York and became the basis for a Broadway show in 1938 and a very successful musical film, Knickerbocker Holiday with Nelson Eddy and Jeanette MacDonald in 1944. In 1815, during a business trip to England to look after the interests of his brother's hardware importing firm, Irving met the great writer, Sir Walter Scott, who encouraged him to continue his writing. The result was, the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, published in 1820. Most of the book's 30 stories concern Irving's impressions of England, but six chapters deal with American subjects, and of those, the tales The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle have been called the first American short stories. The tremendous sketch of the uh, success of the sketchbook in both England and the United States assured Irving that he could live through his writing. Now, early in 1826, he accepted an invitation to the American embassy in Spain, where he continued to write both fiction and biography. But after a 17 year absence in Europe, Irving returned to New York in 1832, and except for four years, when he was ambassador to Spain for the United States between 1842 and 1846, his life at his home, Sunnyside, in Terrytown, New York, on the Hudson River, where he continued to write. As far as a holiday book, well, Irving's Old Christmas was published in book form in 1876 after his death. 
it contains the five Christmas stories found in his 1820 sketchbook, where he portrayed an idealized uh, old fashioned Christmas uh, uh, as it uh, would happen in a quaint English manner. Now, these delightful stories depict English uh, Christmas festivities uh, that he experienced while he was staying in England. Now, the book was widely popular, and today Irving is, con is credited with helping shape the Christmas holiday in America, much the same way Dickens did in England with his 1843 novella, A Christmas Carol. Among Irving's biggest contributions to Christmas in America was his promotion of St. Nicholas as a beloved character, laying the groundwork for the figure we'd eventually embrace as Santa Claus. Well, any one of the five stories in Old Christmas make for a delightful holiday read. Now, next up is a writer you might not be familiar with. Selmer Lagerhoff was born in Sweden in 1858 and died on the family estate there in 1940. She was primarily a novelist, and in 1909, she became the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So Pearl S. Buck won it, but Lagerfeld was the first. Indeed, it was her novels, such as Gosta Berlings, uh, that played an important part in the Swedish Romantic Revival of the 1890s. The period between 1894 and 1907 was very productive. A short story collection, Tales of a Manor, is one of her finest works. And Jerusalem, published between 1901 and 1902, established her as the foremost Swedish novelist. Other notable works were two delightful geography books for children, The Wonderful Adventures of Nils in 1906 and The Further Adventures of Nils in 1907. Well, World War I disturbed her deeply, and for many years she wrote very little. And then in a great comeback, she produced the Varmland trilogy between 1925 and 1928, the books for which she is most known today among adult readers. Well, what about the holiday story? Well, Following an inspirational visit to the Holy Land in 1904, she published Christ Legends, her most well-known book for young readers, which has been loved by generations of children, primarily in Europe. One of those stories is The Holy Night, a Christmas-themed tale. It tells the story uh, of Lagerhoff at five years old who experienced great sadness when her grandmother passed away. While reminiscing about the old woman, she recalls a story that the grandmother used to tell her about the night that Jesus was born. In it, a poor man wanders around the village asking people for a single coal to light the fire in his home. But he keeps getting met with rejection until he runs into an otherwise surly shepherd who finds compassion in his heart to help, especially after seeing the state of the man's home, wife, and children. Now, it's a beautifully written story. Now, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century was Isaac Besheva Singer. He was born in 1903 and passed at the venerable age of 87 in 1991. He was a Polish-born American Jewish writer who wrote and published first in Yiddish and later translated himself into English with the help of editors and collaborators. In 1978, Singer received the Nobel Prize for Literature, He's the only author writing in Yiddish ever to receive that honor. Now, for those who are not familiar, uh, Yiddish is a Germanic language historically spoken primarily by Ashkenazi Jews. The language originated during the ninth century in Central Europe uh, providing the nascent Ashkenazi community with a vernacular based on high German fused with many elements taken from Hebrew and to some extent Aramaic. Most varieties of Yiddish include 
elements of Slavic languages, and the vocabulary contains traces of Romance languages too. Traditional Yiddish is primarily written in the Hebrew alphabet, but now is also widely published using European alphabet. Singer's popular success began with the publication of his first collection, Gimple the Fool and Other Stories in 1957, and his novel, The Magician of Lubin uh, in 1960. Over the next two decades, his popularity uh, grew as he published his stories in magazines such as Harper's and The New Yorker. He also began writing children's books, including uh, Zleta the Goat and other stories in 1966, illustrated by Maurice Sende. He lectured regularly and continued to produce new stories, novels, and collections in both Yiddish and English, including The Spinoza of Market Street uh, in 1963, A Friend of Kafka and Other Stories from 70, Enemies, A Love Story, 1972, and uh, Shashaw from 18, excuse me, 1978. Now, he was awarded two U.S. National Book Awards, one in children's literature for his memoir, A Day of Pleasure, Stories of a Boy Growing Up in Warsaw, and one in fiction for his collection, A Crown of Feathers, and other stories in 1974. Well, originally published as one of eight Hanukkah stories for younger readers in Singer's the Power of Light in 1980, the parakeet named Dreidel tells a heartwarming and often very humorous tale. When young David and Mama and Papa are celebrating Hanukkah one frosty winter evening in Brooklyn, Papa sees a parakeet sitting on the window ledge. He lets the parakeet in and everyone is delighted to find that it speaks Yiddish. They name it Dreidel and becomes part of their family. Well, many years later, when David is in college, he is at a party one night and tells Dreidel's story, only to discover that Zelda, a young woman at the party, owned the bird herself as a child. Papa and Mama are worried that, that they will have to give their beloved pet back, but then, David and Zelda decide to get married after college, and what happens next makes for a truly heartwarming story. Our next holiday story is uh, the great by the great Welsh poet Dylan Thomas. Thomas was born in uh, 1914 in South Wales. Thomas dropped out of school at 16 to become a junior reporter for the South Wales Daily Post. By December of 1932, he left his job at the Post and concentrated on his poetry full time. It was during uh, this time in his late teens that Thomas wrote more than half of his collected poems, just a teenager. In 1934, when Thomas was 20, he moved to London won the Poets Corner Book Prize and published his first book, 18 Poems to great acclaim. In 1936, uh, Thomas met the dancer Caitlin McNamara in a, uh, a London pub. They engaged in a passionate affair and married in 1937. Well, between 1945 and 1949, he wrote, narrated, or assisted with over 100 BBC radio broadcasts, including one show that became the basis for his famous radio drama, Under Milkwood, several, which was published several years later. In 1947, Thomas took his family to Italy, where in Florence he wrote In Country Sleep and other poems, which includes his most famous poem, do not go gentle into that good night. Later that year, Thomas began writing movie scripts for Gainsborough Film Studio. Well, in 1950, Thomas 
went on the first of four tours of the United States and did much to popularize the poetry reading as a new medium for the art. His readings were both famous and notorious. He was theatrical, engaged in roaring public disputes, and he read his work with tremendous depth of feeling. A few days after his last reading in 1953, he collapsed in the Chelsea Hotel in New York after a long drinking bout. He died in St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City at the age of 39, but was buried in Wales. Now, the story that I certainly recommend here is A Child's Christmas in Wales, written in 1952 and then recorded in Steinway Hall in New York in February of that year. It's a masterpiece of language and remembrance. It's an anecdotal reminiscence of a once upon a time Christmas told from the viewpoint of a young boy. As with uh, his poetry, this short story doesn't have a tight narrative structure, but instead uses poignantly descriptive passages to create a sense of nostalgia. If you love beautiful, artfully crafted language, then, well, I not only recommend this, but I also highly recommend Thomas's reading of his story, which is available on YouTube, among other sources, and I give the link on my website. Um, it's just so beautiful to hear it in that beautiful Welsh accent of his. Our penultimate writer is Henry Van Dyke, who was born in 1852 and died in 1933. Now, in addition to being a writer, he was also an educator, a diplomat, and a Presbyterian clergyman. As an educator, he served as professor of English literature at Princeton University between 1899 and 1923, so he had a very long career at Princeton. President Woodrow Wilson, who was a friend and former classmate at Princeton, appointed Van Dyke as ambassador to the Netherlands and Luxembourg in 1913. Now, although inexperienced as a diplomat, Van Dyke uh, conducted himself with great skill, maintaining the rights of Americans in Europe during World War I and organizing work for their relief. Van Dyke returned to the United States where he continued his ministry and his writing and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, among many other honors. And Van Dyke died in April of 1933 and is buried in the cemetery at Princeton. Well, the story that I recommend is The Other Wise Man. It's a novella that expands the account of the three magi as told in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. It tells about a fourth wise man, a, a, a priest named Artaban from Persia. Well, like other magi, he sees signs in the heavens proclaiming that a king has been born among the Jews. Like them, he sets out to see the newborn ruler carrying treasures to give his gifts to the child, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl of great price. However, he stops along the way to help a dying man, which makes him late to meet that caravan of the other three wise men. Well, because he missed the caravan, he can't cross the desert with only a horse, so he's forced to sell one of his treasures in order to buy the camels and supplies necessary for the trip. Well, the rest of the story, again, no spoilers, is quite beautifully told. And it's been adapted many times as a television movie, a stage play, it's even an opera. But here's a fun piece of trivia. A large star sapphire, the star of Artaban, was named after the main character of this story and is currently found in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Well, writer number 15 is Oscar Wilde. He was born in 1854 in Dublin and died in 1900 in Paris. In the early 1880s, Wilde established himself in social and artistic circles by his wit uh, and his flamboyance. Well, eager to uh, further his claim, 
um, Wilde, a claim, right? Wilde agreed to lecture in the United States and Canada in 1882, announcing on his arrival, I love this, when he, when he arrived at customs in New York City and was asked that question, do you have anything to declare? He responded, I have nothing to declare but my genius. <laughs> I love it. Well, despite widespread, hostili widespread hostility in the press for his eccentric manner of dress and behavior, for 12 months, Wilde exhorted Americans to love beauty and art, and it was a very successful tour. Well, when he returned to England, Wilde married Constance Lloyd in 1884, and over the next two years, two boys, Cyril and Vivian, were born. But meanwhile, Wilde became a magazine editor and published The Happy Prince and Other Tales in 1888. Again, it's a masterpiece of fairy tale and allegory. Again, a good example of a literary fairy tale. In the final decade of his life, Wilde wrote and published nearly all of his major work, uh, including his only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and two collections of stories, Lord Arthur Savile's Crime and uh, the house of, excuse me, a house of pomegranates. But Wilde's greatest successes, of course, were his society comedies, his plays, right? Lady Windermere's Fan, A Woman of No Importance, An Ideal Husband, and probably most famously, The Importance of Being Earnest. All were produced to wild acclaim. Unfortunately, his close friendship with Lord Alfred Douglas uh, whom he had met in 1891, infuriated Douglas's father, who accused Wilde of homosexuality, which was a crime under British law. Wilde sued for criminal libel, but after Wilde's case collapsed, he was found guilty and sentenced to two years of hard labor. Upon his release, Wilde spent his last three years in France in bankruptcy, living on the kindness of his friends. Sadly, he died suddenly in 1900 of meningitis. Well, the story that I recommend here is The Selfish Giant. And it's one of five stories that was published in The Happy Prince and Other Tales. In The Selfish Giant, a giant owns a beautiful garden. He takes offense at children who play there after school, and he builds a wall to keep them out. Well, the garden falls into perpetual winter. One day, the giant awakes and discovers that spring has returned to the garden. Why? Because the children have found a way in through a gap in the wall. He sees the error of his ways and resolves to destroy the wall. However, when he emerges from his castle, all the children run away except for one boy who climbs a tree. And the identity of that boy becomes the plot twist of the story and provides the connection to Christmas. And I won't say more. This is truly a beautifully written narrative, one for adults and young readers to savor. Well, okay, before we hear from you, um, I'd like to end with a shout out for some honorable mentions uh, that appear in several holiday best lists. Now, of course, it's all subject subjective, but I agree that these are terrific. And once again, I present them alphabetical order by the author's name. There's Louisa May Alcott's A Christmas Dream and How It Came to Be True. It's truly a pleasant read. Maya Angelou wrote a wonderful holiday poem for the lighting of the National Christmas Tree in 1905. Amazing Peace is a beautiful book of verse. Well, then of course there's Raymond Briggs' classic tale, The Snowman. The 19th century blind Irish writer Francis Brown's collection, Granny's Wonderful Chair, includes a beautiful holiday story titled The Christmas Cuckoo. You might want to try the American novelist Willa Cather's 1896 tale, The Burglar's Christmas. 
The Grimm brothers created an unusually warm-hearted story called The Elves and the Shoemaker, which was originally published in 1812. Wonderful story. James Joyce penned a beautifully written tale of love and loss during the holidays called The Dead, published as part of his collection, The Dubliners. And I highly recommend a beautiful film version of this story with Angelica Houston. Uh, it, it's quite beautiful. Well, Robert L. May's much adapted tale, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, here's a bit of trivia you might not know. It was originally published in 1939 as a holiday book for Montgomery Ward shoppers. Uh, uh, May worked at Montgomery Ward and uh, he was asked to write this story, um, illustrated it, and um, it was handed out to people who shopped at the store. Well, the rest, as we know, is history. And then there's Lucy Maud Montgomery's Christmas at Red Butte. Well, if you enjoy her Green Gables books, uh, you might enjoy Red Butte. In 1902, the same year she published Peter Rabbit, Beatrix Potter also produced a charming holiday tale called The Tailor, uh, the, <clears throat> yes, the Tailor of Gloucester. The 19th century English novelist, Sir Anthony Trollope, wrote a lovely Victorian period uh, tale called Christmas at Thompson Hall. Uh, the tiniest jewel of the day is a two-page letter by Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, uh, written to his daughter Susie that's right up there with Francis Church's editorial to Virginia O'Hanlon. Uh, is there a Santa Claus with that famous line? Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. So, you know, you have a choice there. You could read Twain's A Letter from Santa Claus, or you can read uh, Francis Church's Is There a Santa Claus? And last but not least on the honorable mention list uh, is a wonderful story for Kwanzaa called Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa by the very renowned American folklore story tale and, uh, storyteller and children's book writer, Donna Washington. It's an absolutely delightful and heartwarming tale of a little rabbit who seeks to find something special for his sick grandmother during Karamu, which is the Kwanzaa feast. Now, once again, if you want to learn more about these writers and their stories, uh, again, please visit my website, makingwings.net, and go to Deeper Dive number 15. And there, again, I have not only the material on the 15 writers, but also on these uh, honorable mentions. <clears throat> 